This is uh, still one of my favorite all-time SFF cases. It's a great performing 11 liter case. Definitely still relevant in 2025. Um, but what we're gonna do, we're gonna throw some newer components, uh, updated components at it. Welcome to Machines More. We're talking about the Lian Li A4 H2. At this point, it's been more than three years since launch, almost four, uh, but I think it's still a very good case. And it's uh, the good thing is fairly easy to, to get if you don't wanna you know, go the extra mile for a boutique case. Uh, some of you have been waiting for good deals to come along at this time of the year. In order to do that new build, that's a pretty good plan. Uh, there are definitely some great deals going on now. And uh, what I'll do is I'll link everything down below along with a few options that you can expand out. Uh, they'll be linked down below for your reference. So please consider using those if you're shopping in order to support the channel. So I haven't done a Dan A4H to a build video for a while. And what I'll do in this video is do an updated 2025 mid-range liquid cooled build in this case. And I'll talk through some component choices that you might consider. And then uh, we'll take a look at the performance here. A4H2, I haven't done a build in this one for quite a while. It's a very good case, especially for a liquid cooled build. Uh, we will go ahead. I've uh, opened up the panels. What we're gonna do is take a look at some of the components first, and then I'll walk you through some of the key steps in this build. For this mid-range build, there's certainly a number of options. I think most cost-effective right now for a mid-range gaming build is going to be an Intel 245K build. Other CPUs you could consider, 9700X, which is gonna be a little bit more expensive, slightly better gaming performance. I think in this scenario, you're gonna be limited by the GPU um, anyway. I might as well save a little bit and you can uh, get slightly better GPU if your budget allows. To support that CPU, you're gonna need a an Intel motherboard. Right now, this is the board I'm reviewing, the B860i. Now it does have a specific quirk that I will uh, tell you about right now. It's important to note, if you are getting this board for the liquid cooled build, you should be okay. Now the, the Dan A4 H2 does support air cooling. Um, and so if you are looking at a very compact, like a 92 millimeter type of air cooler, this is not a good idea. The VRM heatsink area is too tall uh, for many of those uh, small 92 millimeter type coolers. Another option is the B860 ASUS. I like this one a little bit better as an overall board. Um, it is better built, um, has an even back shield here. So this is definitely one to consider depending on where the price uh, stacks up. Both boards are very good in that they utilize uh, passive cooling for the power delivery in the board. Um, you've got big board heat sinks here. These are just heat sinks that are independent of the rest of the uh, cooling here. This is just cooling the M.2. And then there's no uh, mini fans in these boards. They're all very good in that regard. Uh, you're gonna get Thunderbolt support for both. Uh, one thing, that the MSI board does really well is that it supports uh, 5GE here. Uh, ASUS board has a 20G USB-C, uh, a second C port here. So USB support, uh, the uh, two boards are gonna be pretty similar. You've got four 5G ports and one 10G port here, and this is uh, one, two, three 5G ports and one 10G ports, but you've got two uh, USB ports, uh, USB 2.0 ports, uh, both have a clear CMOS button. So in that regard, these boards are very similar. Um, like I mentioned, this one, a little bit heavier, better belt. For this build, I'm gonna go with the B860i uh, just to match the color scheme up with the Danny 4 h 20 On the board, uh, we're gonna go with a two terabyte uh, Gen 4 uh, M.2. This is from Bywin. Very high quality. I've been using this one in my personal system for a while and I really like it. Tricky thing right now is RAM. DDR5 prices have gone up quite a bit. So it's perfectly fine to go for a slightly uh, lower speed kit here. Um, considering that this is not, uh, you're not running the fastest GPU, you're not running the fastest CPU. Um, 6,000 uh, megahertz kit or 6,000 megatransfers per second kit is going to be 
uh, where I would aim for. If that is too cost prohibitive, going down slightly, if you see a large uh, amount of savings, a 5600 megahertz kit is uh, also uh, pretty solid. Just go ahead and pop those in here. To cool the CPU, we will go with a 240 AIO. I have two options here, depending on your budget. And I think one of the best uh, PP, price to performance units right now is the, uh, this guy here, the 240 Atmos Stealth. Reviewed this unit. And we will need to grab the Intel backplate. If your budget is a little bit more tight, you can also consider this one from the same company. This is Elite, it's a sub-brand of Cooler Master. It's the Elite 240. And it's also a good choice because the pump block height is uh, low enough to clear in the case. With our Atmos Stealth unit, you won't need to upgrade the fans. These Mobius fans are very high quality. You'll get good temps with this. And uh, the there's a lot of user-friendly features with this one. Board, we're gonna go ahead and install the cooler hardware right now while we have the board out. Just pop the back plate here. Use these standoffs. Just take this off. That's just gonna install toolless. The power supply we're gonna be using is the Cooler Master V850. Another option is the Lian Li, the new Platinum SP850 I reviewed recently, and that's a pretty good unit too. One thing I like to do at this stage is just pop the cables into the board. Okay, like that. Just wanna make sure it seats all the way. That's the 24 pin motherboard connector. The other one that we're gonna do right now, CPU's EPS connector. And that's just this one right here. And then we're going to run these back to the power supply once we manage them up inside the case. It'll be a little bit easier that way. I've popped the side panel off. Let's go ahead and take off the power supply cover here. Go ahead and set that aside right now. First things first, identify our auxiliary, our front panel cables. This is a USB 3.0 header. This is the C header. It's the power switch. Only three things to connect, pretty simple. It will be a little bit easier to connect these before you pop the board in place. The C header here clicks. And then the power switch. It's gonna be this guy here. And the case also has a front audio header, and that's gonna be right here in the bottom left corner. One of these pins is blocked off in the blank. That's so you know how you how you orient it. I usually like to run this right under that the standoff here. And that way when we pop the board in, that it'll seat nicely there. Okay, so right here, we're gonna put our riser cable in. Click, make sure that's fully engaged. That's just gonna connect to your graphics card on the other side. And right now, secure the board down. Four motherboard screws. I've gone ahead and managed the cables up at the bottom here. This entire section down here can be used for managing your cables. And so now we're gonna go ahead and put the power supply in. Uh, the first thing you'll do is actually attach the power supply to the cage, the, the block part of it. And that's just this here. You're gonna have the fan facing the outside so it can actually intake air. We're gonna need four of these power supply screws. For this build, we're gonna be using a GPU that uses a 12V HPWR cable. So we'll take this guy out, which is your 12 volt cable. And we'll just pre-run this so that it's ready to go. Um, that's gonna plug in right here where it says 12V HPWR. Okay. And then we'll plug in our motherboard cables If you're using a GPU that uses an eight pin cable, you can just plug it in now and we'll pre uh, run it to the other side. It's gonna go through the bottom here and connect up to the GPU because the GPU will be flipped. That uh, would, would look like it's upside down. Okay, okay. 
So we'll go ahead and plug this in here. We're gonna keep this power supply out. One thing we wanna make sure to do is install our Intel brackets into the unit. These will just screw right in. The good thing about the Atmos units is that they are very easy to set up. The stuff is well labeled out of the box. It's hard to misidentify things. Everything's labeled really nicely. Pretty user-friendly unit. Okay, with this installed, we can go ahead and pop the radiator in. So your radiator should come with the fans um, pre-mounted on it. And just make sure that the fan cables are going to come out this side because we're going to actually make sure we're, we're connected to it on this side. And what I'll do is just, we'll just put this unit in. We're not going to install it to the radiator panel. We're just going to get it in place. The tube should be running out this side. It's a little bit of a cable management game. But we're, we're not going to apply the thermal paste just yet, and I'll tell you why. Because it may take a little bit of trial and error, and I don't, I don't want to get things too messy. And you want to just see how the tubing all fits in together along with uh, all this stuff here. Since this is an Intel build, we can run the tubes like this. It is very tight just because of the way the tubing has to come under and around like that. So like that here. Okay. And we'll take note of the cable here. We're going to run that over to here, which and we're going to manage that up shortly. You don't need to worry too much about it. You can actually run it underneath the unit. Just make sure you're not uh, compressing on it under the cold plate. All right, this is the AC cable. Make sure this is plugged in and the power supply unit is turned on. We can close up the power supply side, but I would actually only just put like one screw here in case there's a good likelihood we'll have to open this up again just to manage something or, or clean things up so you can put one or two screws uh, just one is good enough right now to put, keep things in place now if you're comfortable with the way you've placed the AIO the pump block then we can go ahead and apply the thermal paste to here and then we'll just uh, position it like that do a line like this and maybe go small dots in the corners it's a longer IHS so we'll pop our bracket screws onto here it's star pattern okay that's that so now we can actually loosen this up and flip things out of the way. The headers we're looking for at the, the pump is going to plug into the, we'll plug it into the header on the right. And then the CPU fans, which come down right here, we'll plug it into the header on the left. Let's pop the radiator bracket in now. Uh, four screws, usually enough for this. And then we can go ahead and attach the radiator bracket. If you've done things correctly, the GPU's power cable will be coming up from underneath here, and that'll help us get ready to install the graphics card. Okay, in the mid-range right now for cards, plenty of good ones to choose from. You could go, you know, mid-range is kind of a flexible definition. 5070, the 70 series cards are gonna be your, you know, typical so-called mid-range cards. Um, this one has 12 gigabytes VRAM. Unfortunately, there's no 16 gig version. If you want 16 gigs of VRAM, uh, 5060 Ti is a good way to get into that. You can also consider the RX 9070. It'll help to connect, uh, to do the power connection first. So we'll just take our 12V HPDR cable. Okay, make sure it's fully engaged. You will not get to check this later because it's gonna be kind of obscured from view. So make sure 
visually make sure that they're all uh, completely seated. I'll just make sure the contacts are lined up and uh, get the card in place. Slot lock. Let's make sure to screw in GPU here, the bracket at the back, just to hold it in place because it is going to be sitting upside down. Just manage things up a little bit here. Make it look nice and neat. And if you're good with all the cable management, you can just screw the power supply cage back in. And that's going to be it. The cage helps to manage the cables up. And we'll just close this up. There's a the little nubbin on this side, so we got to make sure that that is good. So build finished here. It is a relatively straightforward case, save for perhaps getting the tubing and cabling all properly managed into place. But I think that is well worth it since when it is complete, it does look uh, fairly neat. Since we are using a Gen 4 riser cable and a Gen 5 GPU, there's gonna be a step that I would recommend that you do first, and I'll just link uh, my video above, and that'll just help you avoid any issues with the graphics. So 245K, that's gonna be a touch more than 200 right now, uh, even less when there are sales. Something like a 1440p mid-range system, there's not a huge reason to go for the X3D CPUs from AMD unless you get a ridiculous deal or something. It's still a very good CPU for productivity and it's decent at gaming, although certainly it's outclassed by the newer Ryzen 9000 CPUs. But in a GPU limited scenario, I don't think it's gonna be too big of a deal. Uh, taking a look at the performance here in Blender for CPU rendering, it's 130 watt load here. Uh, this system gets great CPU temp. So what I did, I used the stock fan curves for the board just to show you what you can get at default. But with temps this low, uh, I would definitely consider relaxing the curves quite a bit in order to noise optimize. So you can definitely run this at you know 75% max and it'll just be fine. For gaming, the top exhausts will help the GPU thermals a lot. This case is well ventilated with a good enough intake path for the rad fans. So despite the GPU having an impact on the CPU thermals, it's not uh, very severe. The 245K is very, very low power for gaming loads anyway. Uh, here the 5070 is about 225 watts uh, total board power, 1500 RPM. Monster Hunter Wilds benchmark, 1440p high without an, any upscaling or frame gen. Um, 26k score here and uh, getting 77 FPS, so very playable, good uh, performing mid-range 1440p system. So as configured when I did my price research, it came in about 1760 US and that is budgeting a whopping $200 for a 32 gig kit of DDR5 5600. So if you're building now, I, I, I hope you can get it for cheaper. I think not too long ago, a kit like that was a hundred bucks. So this is not great right now. That'll be like one hesitation is the price of DDR5 right now if I'm doing a system build. But yeah, that's the, the state of the world now. So yeah, this is uh, an updated mid-range A4H2L. This is also a very scalable build too, because I would have no qualms about running a hotter CPU in here uh, on AM5. If you wanted to go with a B850i and a 9900X, 9950X, you could run 5080 in here, no sweat. And at the same time, if you're only running a 5060 or older gen GPU in here, it's still not out of place because I think, you know, it's, it's not like this case demands a high-end GPU. It's a really versatile case. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you are subscribed. Please give a like. Uh, links down below, as I mentioned. And big thanks for watching today.